praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, but before then, let's pray. Father, we thank you. Um, we ask for your hand to rest upon us in Jesus' name. Give us revelation. Give us understanding today. Let your name and your name alone be glorified. We give you all the glory forevermore in Jesus' name. Amen. Can somebody say amen? amen. Alright, so we're going to be looking at the principle of sonship. But just to lay a, um, a biblical um, foundation for that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So let's turn our Bibles to um, Matthew chapter 15, verse 4, from the mouth of Jesus. Hallelujah. God wants us to live long. So both our natural parents and our spiritual parents, God encourages us to honor them. Praise the Lord. So that's why today we're honoring pastor. Amen. Because it talks about parents in the Lord. Amen. Also. Amen. So it's a commandment. Praise the Lord. And it's one of the commandments uh, uh, in the Bible. You know when we say children, honor your father and mother, they think he's only talking about children. No, no, no. He's talking about adults. Amen. Praise the Lord. Adults also should. Once you're a child, you have a father, you should honor them. Okay, we're going to take just one one because that's what we can, time can permit us. I'm going to ask Pastor Hugo first, then Pastor Shalom, then I will end. Just one of the principles of sonship. Just maybe, maybe we can just take two, two minutes and see whether we can even do a second round. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Um, the first principle of sonship that I'll mention now is the principle of perception. Now, the principle of perception basically states that a son must know his father and must have the right perception of him. I remember the first time I had the privilege of meeting Pastor, not like Pastor Shalom. You know, I had Pastor Shalom say she met Pastor in 1989. Now, that, that's an ancestor. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I'm a small boy. So I only met Pastor in 1996, and um, that's 20, 26 years this year. And the moment I encountered him, the moment I saw him, I just knew instinctively that this was my father. There was a connection of the heart, you know, and it's that perception that determines the way you relate to him. Just like the woman that saw the prophet in the book of Second Kings, you know, um, Second Kings chapter 4, she saw Elisha, she perceived he was a prophet. It's your perception that determines the way you relate to the man of God. And so I saw him and I knew instinctively that this was my father. And the connection was there. And it's something that nobody can talk me out of because of that conviction. So you need to know, if God has planted you here, he will speak to you and there's a way his words will resonate with you. Thank you very much. You know, at a point, Jesus asked the people and said, his disciples, who do men say that I am? That's the question of perception. Some said it was Elijah, some Jeremiah, some one of the prophets. Then he now turned to them and said, you, 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 what is your perception of who do you say that I am? And one person got it, amen? So you don't need social media to tell you about your father. You should know who your father is. You should have a personal revelation. Close to 27 years. He's one of the finest Christians you can ever see. Pastor is a Christian before a man of God. I can, we can tell you that one. Praise the Lord. That's why you keep hearing him talk about that his greatest joy is not even what he accomplishes here. It's at, at the end that all of us make heaven. Amen. Amen. Let's appreciate God again for that. Pastor Shalom, please, can you give us one? Thank you so much, sir. Another principle we'll be looking at is the principle of exclusivity. And this principle gets to tell us that we have only one father. Just like in the, in, in the biological sense, you only have one father, you can't have two fathers giving back to one person. The same way in the spiritual, we have one spiritual father. And I'm going to um, establish that point from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, from verse 15 to 17. And it was Paul that was uh, speaking to the Corinthians, and he said to them, 
For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. So in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you to be you followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Praise the Lord. So, just the way um, um, Paul was teaching them, he said, you may have many instructors, you, you're free to listen to as many teachers in the gospel, in the faith, but you must be able to identify one person, one spiritual person as your father. And that is exclusive to him. And so, you don't just... Maybe somebody blessed you, you went for a program, so that's my father there. Kenneth Hagen is your father. Copeland is your father. Um, or Robert is your father. That person is confused. Just like in a biological sense, you, you have a surname, and that surname should be your father. You can't go somewhere, meet an uncle, and say, that's my father, and they meet a cousin, that's my father, and they meet a business partner that maybe did something for you, and now say, that's my father. That's not how it works in the, in, in, in the kingdom. We have one father, and that exclusivity means that the honor, the respect you give your father is second to none. Nobody should be treated that way. The honor you give him is exclusive to him. The respect you give him is exclusive to him. How you respond to him is exclusive to him alone. You, you, don't, you don't share that with any other person. That is strictly for your father. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's appreciate God for that. Amen. So you have one father, you don't have two. There's what they call the principle of dual application. Anything you see in the physical will have a representation in the spiritual. So the same way on earth here, you don't have two fathers. Amen. You can have mentors, you can have uncles, but you have one father. Praise the Lord. Uncles don't give inheritance to children. Uncle will give to their own children. So when you don't know who your father is, you will miss your opportunity. What is your inheritance? For example, in Dominion State, we have many inheritance in Dominion State. One of them is the inheritance of, the, of Dominion. That's why we are Dominion City. That's why pastor, whenever he goes, he conquers. So that conquering anointing is upon the church. And it's coming upon you, this, this Dominion. Maybe your own is in the area of business. The ability to conquer. Praise the Lord. The ability to take charge, to take control. Maybe you're in the, in, the, in the information technology world. Maybe you, whatever sector where you are, there is ability to possess your field, your inheritance. So people like us, people think that we are smart. People think that we are something special. There's nothing special about me. I always tell people that if people like us can do it, it shows that it shows that God can do with much more people. When they told me I was going to be a pastor in 1996, I began to cry. What is it that is making us special? Somebody say mantle. Is the anointing upon the mandate? Nothing else. And how do you receive it? By knowing who your father is. Is your father that will give you your inheritance. But you need to be positioned properly. So if God doesn't know who is your father, Angel doesn't know who is your father. Another principle of such is the principle of choice. Choice. John chapter 15, verse 16 says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit will remain, and whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give you. Amen? So God is one that chooses your father. Just like in the natural, you didn't choose who your father was. I'm sure if they gave some of us opportunity, you would have chosen that the person that gave birth to you. Praise the Lord. But God chooses. So, so choosing a spiritual father or deciding who is not, not what you just wake up and just be looking maybe on the TV, okay, find this one. No, I, I choose this one. No. You have to find out who God, God like Pastor Hugo said, God revealed to him that this is his father. God provided the man that he knew that can help me bring the best out of me. And that's
That's why God gave us the P. Praise the Lord. Because of his love. Because of his love. Because he knows your destiny. He knows my destiny. He knows what is best for us. That's why you don't just disconnect from your father. If you disconnect, you wither. Because there's nothing God can do for you again. His, vo- his words activates all my apps. Is somebody hear what I'm saying? Just obey and honor and everything you're looking for will come. So, the principle of choice is that you don't choose your father. God chooses your father for you. So, you need to ask God who is your spiritual father. Amen. We have a personal understanding of all these ones we're sharing. And all the ones that I have written down here are things that I, by the special grace of God, you know, have a personal understanding of. But this particular one I want to share with you, I have, you know, a special understanding of this one. The principle of sonship called the principle of discipline and correction. And um, I'm going to explain why now. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Please just put up for us Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 3. So what this principle states is that a son accepts correction and discipline from his father. So for consider him, verse 3, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be wearied and faint in your minds. Verse 4. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Please continue. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. So there are two wrong responses to correction. The first wrong response to correction is despising it. The second wrong response to correction is getting tired of it, getting weary of it. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourges every son whom he receives. So what this means is if God accepts you as one of his, he will chastise you. Chastisement is proof of acceptance. Correction is proof of love. So let's move on. Verse 7. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father does not chasten? Yes, please move on. Verse 8. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Yes. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we give them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Verse 10. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Finally, verse 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, he yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Nevertheless, afterward, afterward, he yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. It doesn't show up immediately, but eventually, the peaceable fruit of righteousness will show up in the life of the one that is exercised thereby. So, chastening is proof of love. You will never get the orange juice out of the orange until you squeeze it. You're not going to get the flavor out of the tea bag until it passes through hot water. And this is what correction is designed to do. Thank you very much. If God cannot correct you, God said you are like a bastard. The proof that somebody is your father is that he corrects you. He shows responsibility that he loves you, that he wants the best for you. Can we appreciate Pastor Hugo one more time? Pastor Shalom, can you give us one more? Okay. Um, a son loves his father. In the book of John chapter 14, verse 31, Jesus said, But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise and let us go from here. So, um, one of the major relationships we must seek to cultivate with our father is love if you really love your spiritual father you're really going to going to be quick to obey the instructions the the mandate the assignment to be quick to run at uh, the pace of the instructions are coming 
And you see, one beautiful thing about loving your spiritual father is that love secures you. When you really love your father, it doesn't matter what's going on. You're secured in that love. If you're rebuked, you're secured. If you're promoted, you're secured. If you're demoted, you're secured. If you're transferred, you're secured. <laughs> you know, so that security is what helps you to really function properly. You understand? Because people can perceive different things as, you know, you, somebody might even ask you, why is your own different? Why are you not getting this kind of favor? You know what, Pastor, you go share. But you see, when you really love your father, it calms you down and secures you and locks out all kinds of distractions knowing that I love my father and my father loves me so I'm here it doesn't matter what happens I'm here and you see what also that love will do for you is it, when you're really in ministry there are seasons of ministry when it's not all good it's like winter you're in winter where it's rough it's not so good that may be the time you're rebuked the most that's the time you're corrected the most it's like all your efforts nothing is doing well but you see that love helps you go through that winter season till you come into summer because you will face many seasons in ministry but if you have settled it within yourself I love my father it doesn't matter what happens I stay here and I keep serving you will go through that season and come into another season praise God we must love our father amen and once we love them or we love him then you can interpret everything he's saying from the point of what? Of love. Amen. And pastor is a good man. Amen. Oh, very good. <laughs> I remember a particular pastor, they posted him somewhere and he began to cry. And pastor said, why are you crying? He said, it doesn't work like where they posted him. So pastor said, so where do you want to go? He said, I want to go here. <laughs> pastor carried phone and called me and said, post him to the place where he wants to go. Amen. That's the heart of pastor for us. Amen. And today we are appreciating him. We are honoring God for his life in the mighty name of Jesus. Can somebody say amen? amen. Alright, so the next one I want to share today is the principle of honor. Honor. Malachi chapter 1 verse 6 Malachi chapter 1 verse 6 It says, a son honoreth his father and a servant his master if i then be a father where is my honor and if i be a master where is my fear say the lord of hosts unto you O priest that despise my name praise the lord and then you say wherein have we despised your name to next verse you offer polluted bread upon my altar and say wherein you have polluted the in that you say that the table of the lord is what contempt so go back again to verse six you see um so how do you dishonor how do you honor your father god is saying how did they despise him because of the offerings the things they are giving to him praise the lord how do you honor your father the same way by the things you do for him the things you give him praise the lord that's how you honor so if if you are if 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 pastor is your father how you will show it is true what true honor true honor a, fa a son honoreth his father and a servant his master for example, you have natural fathers, you have natural parents. How does the father then your natural parent know that you have actually come to the point to the age of sonship? It's true honor. Praise the Lord. It's true honor. A son honoreth his father. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You see, there are so many principles we study today so many principles we study today and um, one of the greatest principles that shows that you have grown to sonship is honor is honor that's what God is saying here he said a son honoreth his father I believe that this is one of the greatest uh, principles that have helped us as sons 
because a father carries the blessing. Praise the Lord. And that blessing rests upon honor. You know, many years when we grew up and we work, and we and we started growing up with pastor, um, you know, we, those days we come and we see pastor, you know, being the one giving to us, ministering to us. Pastor will finish ministering to us and then he will be the one to give back to us. Praise the Lord. And we saw that there are a lot of capacity that pastor had that some of us were not able to tap into that. Praise the Lord. But when we began to honor, when we began to give back, when we began to appreciate him for his role in our life as our father, we saw that our capacity began to enlarge. And there are certain inheritance pastor has that began to fall upon us. For example, the anointing for dominion, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation. All those abilities began to rest upon us. Praise the Lord. So we are in a dominion mandate. And there is the grace you need to conquer your territory in the name of Jesus. That comes when the Father releases the blessing upon your life. Praise the Lord. Because we can learn a lot of things that pastor have taught us. But there is the power, the ability, the anointing to possess our inheritance. That is given. Praise the Lord. When the Father releases a pronouncement upon our life. Hallelujah. So this particular principle is very, very important to me. Pastor spoke a word over my life. And that was the beginning of a whole new possibilities before me. Praise the Lord. Now, how do you honor? Honor is substance. The Bible said, honor the Lord with your substance. You don't just honor with mouth. For example, if somebody have done, maybe uh, somebody have done something great in the community and they want to honor him, they honor him with something, maybe with a chieftaincy title. Honor is something that is, that is visible, that is something that is, is manifest. Praise the Lord. Don't just honor with your lips. Honor, the, Isaac said, give me venison such as I love. There is something you can do to provoke that anointing that is upon your father. Praise the Lord. There are some things you do. I have known some people that have done some very serious things and pastor released that grace upon them and he changed their lives. And that has been our testimony in the name of Jesus. And today we're celebrating pastor, celebrating how he has been a huge blessing to us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The principle of defense. The principle of defense. You know, I, I, I said all the principles that we have shared are principles that we have embodied. Principles that have become part of us, you know. Um, you know, following pastor has been absolutely mind-boggling. I'll share another principle with us. Um, the principle of defense. It is a son's responsibility to defend his father. And you see, in defending your father, you are protecting your destiny. Because when the enemy tries to come for you, what he does is he tries to take out your father. And if he does, then he's able to have access to you. You see, pastor has taught us that the father is like a root. You have the root, you have the shoot, and you have the fruit in the tree. Now, that root is what gives you stability. That root is the invisible part, but it is responsible for the stability of the tree. It's the invisible part, but it's also responsible for the nourishment of the tree. It's the invisible part, but it is also the root, the identity of the tree. If you fight my father, you're fighting my identity, my lineage. So, the towing van principle. You don't have to have a good engine in your car. You don't have to have good tires. You don't have to have a good anything. If the car breaks down, all you need to do is find a towing van that knows where it's going to. And when you hook up your destiny to that towing van, you get to where you're going to. 
So I'm not going to allow you to talk down on my father. That will never happen. In 2 Kings chapter 6, where the sons of the prophet and Elisha went somewhere to expand their space where they were living. And then in 2 Kings chapter 6, the son of the prophet picked up an axe. And while they were cutting all the trees down to expand the horizon, one of, the, one of them had his borrowed axe. The axe fell inside the water. And the moment he fell inside the water, he shouted and said, Alas, for it was borrowed. He called on his master. He said it was borrowed. Every one of us is carrying a borrowed axe. The grace I am enjoying is something I am functioning under. And the interesting thing is that when he lost the axe, he called back on Elisha. Elisha asked him, where did it drop? Well, you know the point at which you lost your anointing, the point at which you lost your favor, the point at which you lost your progress, you know it. The next thing to do is to find the person that can restore it. And he spoke to Elisha, and Elisha put his hand inside the thing, and the thing began to float. And as the thing began to float, he picked it up. So, my destiny is important to me. The vehicle of my destiny is big. I need a giant towing van to pull it. When Reuben messed up, lost his borrowed axe, it was Jacob that restored it. When Peter lost his borrowed axe, it was Jesus that restored it. In the book of Numbers chapter 14, God spoke 10 different times. Israel transgressed against God. God wanted to kill Israel instantly. But Moses spoke in their favor, prayed for them. And after praying for them, God said, I have heard your prayer and I will do what you have said. But he said, these 10 times, these people have provoked me. They've transgressed against me. And Moses was there every single time to help them to navigate out of their transgressions. But the day Moses transgressed, Moses' transgression was Israel's condemnation. So if you touch my pastor, you touch my father, you have condemned me. Thank you, sir. Amen. Pastor Shalom. <laughs> Amen. Um, we're going to see the, a son follows his father. The principle of followership. And uh, I want to read a scripture in Second Timothy um, chapter 1 verse 13. Paul was talking here and he said, Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Um, all over the internet, all over, there are so many voices, people speaking, preaching different things. We as a people in this ministry, we must pay due diligence to make sure that we follow the words of our father. You see, Bible can be interpreted many ways, but if you're really a son, you will follow your father's interpretation. People can come up with different things, and that's what we keep us safe. That's what will keep you safe. So because the, 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 the realm of the spirit is a very broad place. And so it's good you follow your father and follow where he's headed, his vision, his words, the assignment. You don't need to be distracted. When you follow him, you will get to your destination. He's a compass. We follow him. No, Paul said to Timothy, follow me as I follow Christ. And I'm sure there were other men of God there. There were other apostles. But he said to him, follow me as I follow Christ. It doesn't make the other ones wrong. But you must know who you're following. And follow well. Follow the message, follow the vision, follow the mandate. We're not looking, we're not pushing any other mandate. It's one mandate, the dominion mandate. That's what we're following. That's what we're preaching. That's the message we're learning. You must know your father's message. Have it. Have you finished listening to all peace message? You know, Pastor said something to us some years. He said, The anointing of this ministry is in the minister, the principal, him, and in the message. It's in the message. So we must have the message in our hearts. 
and follow the pattern of ministry. You see, anything you don't see, Pastor, you don't bother. Influing power, for, see, is the, you see, Pastor, the simplicity of it. There's so many things going out there. One of the things that will keep all of us safe, we follow our Pastor. What I don't see him do, I will not do. Praise God. And so we must follow the Father we know. God bless you. A son continues his father's legacy. You see, what the father started must not end with the father. It must continue with the sons. Actually, as I began to grow in my sonship with pastor, I've started discovering that this one weighs very much to him. That the mandate that God has given to him now let me tell us one of the principles of God whenever God wants to bless a generation God raises a man he doesn't raise many people he raises a man but when God is raising that man he has a generation in mind God raised Abraham and when I pray about when I pray for pastor the revelation God gives me about pastor is the revelation of Abraham that out of pastor many families of the earth will be blessed that's one of the things that helped me to know that pastor's calling is not just with dominion city actually it's a privilege for pastor to still give us attention that's the truth pastor is beyond dominion city dominion city just one of the offspring of his mandate god raised one abraham but when God raised Abraham, God had Isaac in mind. God had Jacob in mind. God had the patriarchs in mind. So even God told Abraham that his seed will possess. Not, not, not just Abraham. His seed. So you can see why pastor is concerned about the seed. Pastor one day called us and said that it's not what he does now that means much to him. He has conquered territories is what we now do. That's why he comes hard on us when you are not manifesting your destiny. Now, in continuing our father's legacy, we must understand Psalm 68 verse 11. And the Lord gave the word. There is a word the Lord gave. He gave the word to Moses. And that was, was, was that word that God gave to Moses was preached for thousands of years. Nobody added anything to it. And whenever you preach the word, the Lord that gave the word will put anointing on the word. One of my biggest times are times when I finish listening to pastor's message. And I come to the pulpit. And I began to speak them. The same anointing falls on because what God confirms is the word, not your word. So there is a message God has given to us. That message must go around the world because the Bible said, the, "And great, the the responsibility of the great company is to publish the word that God gave." So, you see, because sometimes we are so proudful, you know, I tell some pastors, I don't know nothing is happening in my church. I said, that means you are not aligning to the mandate. You see, for God to use people like us, he can use anybody. He can use anybody. For someone like me, I believe that my primary calling when I came to the ministry was to serve pastor. And that is what he still is. To serve, to hold his hand to find what can make pastor's job easy. So when people like us are given an opportunity to preach, it's extra privilege. Oh. It's extra privilege. Because when I was made a pastor, I told you guys in one of the sessions, I said I began to cry. So, but for God to confirm the words we speak, it means that it can happen to anybody. That's why God raises people like us, to let you know that he can use anybody. Because it is the, the stone that the builders have rejected. 
once you can align to the message of God, God, you don't have to be special. Just follow what God is saying. Do you know if you start preaching the word that pastor released this year alone, 20 years you have not finished. So what is the key to extending the legacy of the father? Take the words, the words that God has given to the father. Find your city. Find your city. Find your territory. Do you know that there are certain places where the, the guy in France gave me a testimony all they need just to go and play pastor stage and healings will be happening. Pastor's messages. That's, the, that's what they gather. He doesn't have confidence enough to preach. And healings and testimonies are happening. People have been healed in the services. And now he said they have seven centers in France already. Just by playing tapes. How much more will you now give voice to that tape? For us as a son, we must take the legacy, the mandate, the word that God has given to our pastor. Extend it to your territory because there are some places pastor cannot go, but you are there. You are the voice. You know, you know, you know, you know the three. Some people go to some place and say, ah, there's no dominosity there. You, who are you? Are you a dominosity? Praise the Lord. When the fruit falls from the tree and falls on the ground, does it look for another person to, what does it do? It, it rises up and produces another tree. That's what fruits do. Maybe the wind blows the fruit to a, the seed to a different place. What does it do? It duplicates what the father, what is the original branch. You are a seed. Wherever you are, you have been planted in the name of Jesus. Go in your might, in the mighty name of Jesus. The same grace <laughs> upon pastor will fall upon you in the name of Jesus. The same thing that when pastor lift up his hand, people are falling. Just go take the same word, pray over it, so take time to soak on it, lift up your hand. The same angels will look, because angels confirm the word. Where that word is being preached, angels begin to locate extend the father's legacy to your city in the name of jesus god gave the word and great was the company of them we are part of that company in jesus name amen his son trusts his father and he has faith in his father's love um look at jesus hebrews chapter 2 verses 12 and 13 he said, saying, I will declare thy name. He was quoting what Jesus was saying. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God had given me. So Jesus said, I'll put my trust in the Father. He has faith in the Father. He put his trust in the Father. We find in John chapter 5, verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. So it says, for the Father loves the Son. So the Son has confidence, had confidence. And the Son has confidence in his Father's love. The Word was made flesh. So there are things that we have embodied and are manifesting. Because there are things that by the special grace of God, God has been able to help us understand. You know, even if you don't know where, how you're being taken along the way, a son trusts his father's love for him. And he knows there's no father. Jesus said, no father will give to his child a scorpion when he asks for a fish. Or give to that child a stone when he asks for a piece of bread. And ever since then, I have been completely relaxed. There are so many things I can talk about, Pastor. For, for example, Pastor is, you know, I, I don't just see him as a developer of the human capacity. I see him as a miner. That's what he does. That mining, he gives him a lot of compassion for people. And he has immense trust in the human potential. Pastor doesn't give, doesn't give up on people. That's one thing I can tell you authoritatively, very clearly. I can tell you. Any person that falls away, fell away by himself. And so, I have come to understand that 
anything he asks me to do he's very particular about being in the middle of the will of God and anything he asks me to do there's nothing he has ever asked me to do that I have done that has not translated to me becoming a better person and this is what the principle of trust is about thank you sir Amen principle of love a son loves his father I do as the father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the father rise let us go from here so you see um, we are very very familiar with father loving us but the son also needs to love the father if you love your father you will honor him if you love your father, you will obey him. If you love your father, you will protect him. If you love your father, you will cover, you will defend. You will be able to align with him. And you see, there are many seasons of life and many seasons in ministry. We have the summer, the winter, the spring, and the autumn. The summer and the springtime are the times things are very going very well. Maybe you're in the best part of the world where you want to be as, in a, as a pastor or as, you know. And then the winter part might be where you're transferred to Sambisa. The winter part might be when you're corrected or when you're rebuked seriously. Or, you know? But you see, that love you have for your father sustains you through all the seasons. That so when, when you face the winter or the stormy part of ministry, you are still there because it's beyond the work. It's beyond the assignment you're giving. It's more than that. There's love in your heart for this father that is raising you. You can bear anything. And even if things go wrong and maybe you don't maybe you want a position and it doesn't come to you it goes to somebody fusion it doesn't matter love sustains you through all those period and you see if you really love your father you'll be secure in the love you see one of the things that separates sons from slaves is this love thing a, a servant looks at how he's treated and compares himself with others but his son doesn't care he's in the we are here we are not going anywhere. This is our thing. This is ours. He takes ownership of the vision of the mandate. This is ours. This is ours. You see, if you love your father, you will know he means well. You will be secure. It doesn't matter what happens. You will be very secure. This has kept many of us. That security, we love our father. And we know he loves us and means well for us. That keeps us calm. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor Shalom. Okay, I want to say one that is very, very also important to me. A son has a personal revelation of his father. What can you tell me about the P? Now, Jesus said something in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. And when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some said Elias, that's Elijah. Others said Jeremiah. People will always have their revelation of your father. Now Jesus turned to them and said, And said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Because the the, 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 this principle of revelation is important. That will, that's what will sustain you in crisis period. And then Peter answered and said, and Simon said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Wow. Not just their pastor. This is the Messiah. The difference is so, so vast. Because that is a revelation that Judas didn't have. That he finally got it later, but it was too late. That he has sold not just his pastor, he has sold the son of God. He couldn't bear it. That's why he committed suicide. And of course, if you commit suicide, you're not enter, that's where you're going to meet God. I get what I'm saying. So, we must have a revelation of pastor. And it's one of the things that God has given some of us opportunity to have and that's why 
you know, we do our best, you know, for this, this calling, for, 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 for this calling, for God to help us to do our part. You see, Pastor Shed, if you, if you listen, and I'm sure this is not the first time you must have heard Pastor Shed, about the, move, the moves of God. Pastor Shed it again in, in, in UK, in camp meeting, that was the climax of camp meeting, where we are in God's move. And Pastor, you have used several things, several scenarios to describe. You have used the three dimensions of the tabernacle to the, the outer court, to the inner court, and uh, the holy, holy place and the holy holiest of all. Now, in UK, he used the three feasts. The feast of Passover, the feast of weeks, that's the feast of uh, Pentecost, and the feast of tabernacles to explain the three moves of God. Now, for each move of God, in 1517, when the first uh, the evangelical restoration began, God used a man called Martin Luther. That's in Germany. And Pastor explained to us how that ran for 100, 400 years. And then the move of God moved to uh, America and through the ministry of a man called H.S. Seymour. Because God will always find a man. Now, the move of God has come to the, to the final, to the, to the climax, which is where we are. And pastor is one of the voices God is using for this move. Some of us didn't know it. On, so there are certain, because it is not, pastor began to talk about this in 1998. In fact, we had a, a camp meeting called, uh, the one we brought the tabernacle into, <laughs> into, into camp meeting. Yes, was it in him? Yes. It was in UNN because I know I was the pastor and they built, I didn't know why they were building it. And he built, they brought a tabernacle, built it inside camp meeting. And God, pastor spoke a message that they called Beyond the Veil. And there was even a music, there was a, a music that was produced. So now this, this is are making, are making meaning to us. That pastor is a custodian of God's divine mandate. Moses represented the move of God. Because, you see, but pastor told us that when God starts something, he finishes it. Why did God raise Moses? Is it just because he wants them to come out of Egypt? No. Because God wants the nation of Israel to settle in their promised land. So that the 12 tribes can have the place where they are. So that the tribe of Judah will begin to blossom. So that Jesus can be born in Bethlehem. So that the redemption of man can be accomplished. So when God was raising Moses, he had Jesus in mind. So you see, so when they came against Moses' his siblings, that is um, Aaron and the anger that God came, it wasn't just because they were just dealing with a priest. He said, if it was just a prophet I'm dealing with, I would deal with them in visions and dreams. It's not like it's not like Moses. That Moses was a person that saw the similitude of God in the old covenant. And why did God show manifest himself to him? Not because he loves Moses more, but because of his assignment. So when God finished preaching that message and lifted, behold, Miriam had leprosy. So we you, you can be in Domino City, for example, and most times people behave the way they behave because they lack revelation. The people of Israel told David that he can no longer go with us in battle. Least we quench the light of Israel. So every son has a right to know the father for himself. And that's why and that's why every son must connect to the father directly. It doesn't matter the chapter you are in. Hook up to the original. To the source. Praise the Lord. So a son must have a personal revelation. So when somebody tells you something about you know you know you already have an experience god has revealed god has revealed him to you and there's something that comes out of prayer and then out of love too as you begin to pray god will begin to speak to you 
so that when Pastor Nan corrects, do you, do you know that as I as I run, do you know that there was um, um, there was a time in in, the, in 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 Israel where some people had problem with Moses, and one of them Moses summoned him because that person was related to Moses. He wanted to join Korah in that rebellion, so. That person was a relation to Moses, that boy. And Moses sent for Moses to the boy to come. Do you know what the Bible said? And the boy refused to answer Moses. He refused to go. He refused to go. I was shocked that somebody can take such an action. Because when you lose the revelation of your father, you, lose your, you can lose your fear of God. You can do some things. Do you know that David said, how can I lift up my hand against the lost word? You know why he can say that? Not, not because he, he, I mean, he wasn't justified, but he has a revelation of the man. Our revelation of our father protects us. It makes us to be calm even when you don't feel happy. I got what I'm saying. You are calm because you know you are not just dealing with a man. You are dealing with God and his mandate. Amen.